Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have legendary inspirational athlete BJ Bedford Miller. She's an Olympic gold medalist, former world record holder at the 2000 Sydney Olympics for the 400 medley relay. She's two-time world champion, eight-time US national champion, two-time Pan American Games champion, and the list goes on and on. Wow, you could be witness, witnessing one of the greatest relays in history right now with the way they're going to break this world record. This is an incredible swim. Susie O'Neill is doing a great job of putting Australia for a solid server, but this is all USA. And how appropriate is it that Dara Torres swims the final leg? An amazing comeback, retired from the sport, for seven years, as you take look a look line. at the world record line, <laughs> it's way back there. Dara wow. Torres out of retirement and into the Olympic parade for the fourth time, and the Americans are going to absolutely obliterate the world record. Wow. They're under four minutes. And the line just touched. Gold again for the American women. And the 13th world record set at these games. There's B.J. Bedford. B.J. Bedford. Air oh. white and blue. She got it off to a great start. Winning that first leg. May have won the fastest foot in history on her breast. Jenny Thompson, a solid 57 2. And then Derek Torres, who just got out of the 50 freestyle final. She goes 53 plus. Look at B.J. Well, I thought they were going to break into a little break dance there. <laughs> Bedford made the Olympics rally last month at her fourth try. Wow. Can you imagine that? And to get here and win a medal at age 27, we talked about all the medals that Torres and Thompson have, but talk about a sweet Olympic moment for B.J. Bedford. Well, and, you know, the end of the race was absolutely... Spectacular. You can see the girls cheering them on, cheering uh, Dara Torres on. And when she touched, and to realize under four minutes, Dan, can you, you know, in this sport, you just don't see that very much. Three seconds, that's just mind boggling. But you know, they had that capability. If they just put together all their best times, that's what it added up to. And they just did that. Four perfect swims for the American women. So the standings. And the 4x100 medley relay, the United States takes out the world record in a huge way. Australia finishes second, and Japan gets the bronze. 16-year-old Megan Kwan there, second from the left, is the babe there among the seasoned veterans. Bedford, Thompson, and Torres, in all probability, have swam their last Olympic race. DJ, thank you so much for joining me. Jeremy, thank you for having me on your show. It was a... Uh... Surprising to be contacted after, you know, 14 years since I've been a, an athlete. <laughs> You're still legendary. Oh, uh, well, yeah, in my own mind. <laughs> yeah, just... BJ, and since this is Inspired Insider, you know, I want to ask, um, what's the most painful moment hmm. that you had to overcome and, and walk us through kind of what happened in your thinking? Um, so I, I created all the most painful moments, I would say. Uh, <laughs> I would I think that the most painful moment was going into Olympic trials and and the hundred backstroke in nineteen ninety six. I was seated number one in two events going into the, the Olympic trials. I got third place in the hundred back and you have to be first or second to make the team. I knew I wasn't gonna make the team before the race. Like I knew and all I could think about was are they still gonna like me if I don't make it? I mean, that's when, as I said, you go into the your brain and it's just the, the black box in there. You, it's not a fun place when you when you let it run rampant, right? If you don't have some people to pull you out. Um, but I, I remember walking up to Whitney Hedgepeth, who Whitney and I were on the same team. She qualified in the hunter back that year, and being like Whitney, no matter what happens, like we'll always be friends. And she just, I think she just kind of looked at me like, whatever, BJ. Duh. But for me, I was really, like, there's a, a really raw, scared, sad piece of me that was frightened that if I didn't do this, people wouldn't love me. And the only person who wasn't going to love me was me. Um, and I didn't. You know, I, I 
I missed that team and it crushed me. I didn't even make the final in the 200 backstroke, which was the other event that I was ranked number one in the country. Uh, I, I fell apart after that. It was a really dark time. Um, and that's when I, 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 was, I drank a lot. I started doing the bartending job. And then, you know, there, as I said, there were a few people who kind of would pull me aside and be like, what, what are you doing? This isn't you, you know, and maybe it was the worst reflection of me. Um, and I was in a relationship that wasn't working. Um, so it was really just, and, and that was probably not the relationship's fault, but more, again, me bringing the negativity and all of that darkness to it. Um, I remember at that point I got an, a piece of paper from USA Swimming that said, um, if you're interested in the resident team, check this box. And I was thinking, well, it's a good way to sort of kind of keep up with what's going on. It's an interesting thing. I wasn't thinking they would ask me to come and be part of it. I really thought it was just a way to tertiary, be tertiarily, if that's even a word, <laughs> involved with the sport without doing what I was doing. Um, and then I got a phone call from John D. Skinner who said, uh, I'd like you to come and try out for this team. When I, I, I perked up, and I think I went out there because he said, I'd like you to come try out. Like, and there was a piece of me that was like, what do you mean try out? You're not just asking me to be on the team because uh, you should just be asking me. <laughs> It's so funny you have like the dichotomy of the feeling so low and insignificant and yet I'm like, oh, I'm so significant. <laughs> so I flew out there and I had a conversation with Jaunty. Well, he had me swim for a while. He filmed me underwater and then he, uh, he pulled me into his office. He got, get your towel, come sit here. And he watched the film and he looked and goes, I think I can help you. And it was really weird. It wasn't like, it wasn't a rah-rah speech. It was really looking at the technique and the dynamics of what I was doing underwater. And he said, yeah, I think, I think I can make you faster. Like, I think I can help you. And that was what he had meant by the, the trial. Like, he wanted to see if I was technically perfect and if maybe I had gotten to the very best that I could be. I see. And it, I hadn't. And he said, you know, tell me about what you want to do. And at that point, I found myself saying things like, I just want to go to the Olympics. I just want to, I just want to achieve this dream and, and um, you know, some things like that. And uh, <laughs> typical John T. style. He's a very uh, mumbly South African. Rah, 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 rah. Um, I remember him saying, well, I'm a sucker for a dream. And, and that was it. I, <laughs> And, uh, and he said, I want you to come here for four years. And this was October of 1996, and I, I was coming off the Olympic trials and watching the super successful Olympics, feeling like my team had left me behind. And uh, I was like, well, I'll give you a year. And if it works, I'll give you another year. And if that works, I'll give you one more. <laughs> I'm like, but I can't commit to four years today at 23 years old, feeling like my life was still halted from entering into the rest of my life. Um, but I think that was, that was again, the most, probably the most painful thing I went through in my professional career. And I, the thing I noticed most is that I depend a lot on other people to pull me out. So yeah. I'll reach out oh, for that. Thank you for sharing that. That's, you know, very tough, very tough time. And, you know, when you're going through that, and how do you drop everything? He said, come here for four years. And yeah. what did your schedule look like at that point? Because that's, a, again, a huge commitment for you. Yeah, it was, for it was a lot. Yeah, well, um, my prospects didn't look that great. <laughs> I told you I didn't have, I had a, a kind of a failing relationship. Again, I, I take full responsibility for it because um, I think I was creating the failure. Uh, I, I had a degree and I was tending bar. <laughs> so I wasn't really, you know, on a, beeline to the moon for my career. <laughs> I was just kind of hanging out in Austin uh, where I'd gone to college and um, kind of not sure what I wanted to do and this was something that really kind of gave me some direction. So um, I, I, my boyfriend at the time and I kind of broke up, kind of didn't, I don't know, it was, it was mishmashy like everything else was in my life at that point. But I'd 
drove to uh, to Colorado Springs in my little Pontiac Le Mans, packed to the gills with all of my junk, and they're in the middle of a huge snowstorm on October 21st, 1996. I didn't even make it to the training center. I got to a hotel and pulled off the side of the road because it was like whiteout conditions, and I was coming from Texas. I was like, ah! So, uh, yeah, I stayed, got in a hotel and checked into the dorms the next day and started my life. So what it looked like was practice was every morning from 7 to 9. Um, eat, go take a nap. Wake up, uh, waits for from 1.30 to 3.30, and there by it wasn't like two hours of lifting weights. I am a very social weightlifter. <laughs> I would walk around, I would talk to everybody, I would try to pretend to do pull-ups and not do as many, and then my weight, co weight coach Tony Bellafato would be like, "That was only eight," and I would be like, "Oh," but it was a big game for me. Um, well, I was actually like 1.30 to three, and then we'd swim from three to five, and then I'd go home, and you'd do it all over the next day. Yeah. So what's the hardest part about being a professional swimmer? Um, there's no money in it. <laughs> so how did you, I mean, I mean, how was that funded? Because you're basically just training all day. Yeah, so I was actually sponsored by Nike, so Nike helped me a lot. The USOC and the United, and United States Swimming helped with a lot of that. I was living in the dorms, so I didn't have any expenses because the resident team program, is, it exists so that they can take athletes out of life and have them focus entirely on training. So I did that for a few years and, and I was, um, you had to be top four in the country for, or top four in the world to get a stipend from USA Swimming if you are the number two American, top six in the world if you were top, if you were the number one American. In any given event you would qualify for a, I think it was $1,500 a month or something like that with no taxes taken out so you get killed at the end of the year. Um, so, I mean, I didn't spend a whole lot, but I mean, it, that's the thing, is it just allows you to really, really focus, but your life is on hold. So, if you don't win the Olympics, it's real hard to feel like you didn't just waste four years of your life. You know what I mean? It, the whole world of it conspires to keep you exactly the same. So, you go and you live at the Olympic Training Center, they don't want to change a thing. If you're winning, if you're at the World Championships, you're at the Olympics, you're performing at a very high level, they don't want anything to change. They want to keep you exactly the way you are. Um, so they shut out all the distractions, all those things, those horrible moments that make us who we are, they want to make it so those never happen. So um, what ends up happening is you store them all up and then you run into them at the end. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, BJ, you mentioned the beginning of the interview, Amy Van Dyke and Rowan. Yeah. And um, she was obviously a friend of yours. When did you first hear about that? Uh, I heard about it um, pretty much right away. Dave Deniston and I are really good friends, and he had something similar happen to him. Um, but he had a sledding accident. And, um, yeah, I heard about it really quickly, um, like a day or two after it happened. And, uh, oh, gosh, yeah, it's still... Makes me tear up a little bit, but she's doing awesome. Um, I think one of the things that's really so incredible is the fact that she's going to be able to speak for an entire legion of people who have no one to speak for them. You know, she's, you can't keep Amy quiet, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> so, speaking for, as someone who is also very difficult to shut up, <laughs> but I think Amy with a mission is someone who is so powerful and amazing and can bring so much to so many. Um, I think it's, I'm, I'm really sad that this happened to her, but I think she is going to be able to advocate for and have a real purpose for herself um, in a way that I don't think she's had in a while. So I'm really excited for what's next for her. Yeah, and for people who don't know what happened, Amy was a you know, six-time Olympian and uh, she had a spinal cord injury. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She severed her spinal cord when her ATV landed on top of her. She not only severed her spinal cord; she um, she broke eight eight vertebra. Four of them are fused. Two more on the top and two more on the bottom were healing when I went to see her. Um, and then she had also broken, I think, at, at least two, maybe four ribs. I mean, she was. I'm amazed. The the fact that she's alive is a miracle. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I read an article that it was like millimeters from her aorta or something just crazy. Yeah, really. It's uh, crazy. So what did you talk to her about? Oh. Um, Tough yeah. conversation. And, you know, Amy is somebody who makes light of everything. So she talked about all, well, like we, we both love to laugh. Um, so it's probably why we've been friends for a really long time. And uh, so we, we kind of laughed. I mean, I was texting her, and I was like, uh, how long before I can bring you some wine? Because <laughs> we always will drink wine when we're together. And uh, she's like, I go, am I allowed to bring wine? She goes, I'm paralyzed, not brain dead. Do you bring me wine? <laughs> <laughs> so we are, uh, you know, we it, and she's on a massive concoction of painkillers until she's, um, until everything heals right, and I, I don't know how long that's going to be either. But um, so we didn't actually drink anything. For <laughs> she's still healing, but um, we uh, yeah. Well, we talked about the different classes she's taking at or she took at Craig, and they have classes on how to be in your life and um, all that kind of stuff. I mean, like the the fundamentals, like how do you go to the bathroom? How do you, you know, all this stuff that who would ever think about and why would you ever want to know or ask? So. You have to relearn everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, was it just that. business as usual with her? I mean, when you talked or was there more of a heart-to-heart -heart conversation? Too? No, you know, it was. It, I think we both tried to keep it really light because, I mean, the last thing I wanted to do was um, not be strong for her. So I wanted to, to show her that, that we were, I was happy, and that, you know, I didn't think of her any differently. Um, and the thing that was funny that I noticed right away is, you know, Amy has this horrible accident, and um, she's taking care of her friends, like texting us, "Hey, I'm okay." And because I, oh gosh, Christy Kowal, Dave Denniston, um, you know, Nicole Hazlett, we we were all connected, going, "Oh, oh no, oh gosh," you know, and. Then she's reaching out saying, hey, you guys, don't worry about me. I got this. You know, and she's out there taking care of us. And I was like, I couldn't go in there and be like a puddle of mush. Like that just wouldn't be fair to what she's going through. Yeah. Even though as soon as I left, I was like, ah! Understandable, yeah. yeah. BJ, this has been truly amazing. I just want to thank you so much. Thank you for, for doing this. Yeah, thank you for the interview. It was really fun. You, glad I didn't. I'm, I'm wearing uh, mascara, so crying was, I was I was a little close a couple times, but <laughs> held it back. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank I you. appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. A clean sweep for the American women on the relays and a world record. Jenny, we need a calculator almost for your medals now. <laughs> Ten Olympic medals. It seems like a perfect way to go out. Is this it? Yeah, this is a really special way to end. We smashed the world record. It's really exciting. BJ's little flip was cool, too. I like that. I meant, I meant an end more personally for you. Are you going to retire after this? Uh, I think I'll do a little more. I don't know if I'll do another Olympics, but we'll see. Jerry, you're right behind with nine medals. Now, if I have my figures right, you won your first medal in the Olympics about the same time that Megan was born. <laughs> what does this say about this team? I hear that all the time. It means that we have a great team, but it also shows that, um, you know, you don't have to be a young teenager to swim fast. And Megan, you get to take these medals back to school. Are you going to show them off? I'm going to show everyone. <laughs> show and BJ, you waited so long for this. You look like you're about to bust and you swam your personal best. How great is this for you? Oh, I'm so excited. And all, all I know is we just brought home a world record for the United States of America. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, man. So the American women crushed the world record and probably also set some kind of demographic record. Two distinct generations of U.S. swimmers combining, ranging from 16-year-old Megan Kwan to 33-year-old Dara Torres. Here is their medal ceremony out at the Aquatic Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the national anthem of the United States of America.
A total of 22 Olympic medals on that podium. Thompson now owns 10, eight of them gold in Olympic history. The only woman with more golds than Jenny is the great Soviet gymnast of the 50s and 60s, Larissa Latinina. She won nine. Torres, seven years away from the pool, returns to win five medals here in Sydney, three individual bronze, two relay gold.